Team Five. Nomadic Empires. The term nomadic empires can appear contradictory. Nomads are arguably quintessential wanderers organized in family assemblies with a relatively undifferentiated economic life and rudimentary system of political organization. The term empire, on the other hand, carries with it the sense of a material location, a stability derived from complex social and economic structure, and the governance of an extensive territorial dominion through an elaborate administrative system. But the juxtaposition on which these definitions are framed may be too narrowly and a historically concept. They certainly collapsed when we study some imperial formation constructed by nomadic groups. In theme 4, we studied state formation in the central Islamic lands whose origin lay in the Bedouin nomadic tradition of the Arabian Peninsula. This chapter studied a different group of nomads. The Mongols of Central Asia, who established a transcontinental empire under the leadership of Genghis Khan, straddling Europe and Asia during the 13th and 14th centuries relative to the agrarian based imperial formation in China. The neighboring nomads of Mongolia may have inhabited a humbler, less complex, social and economic world, but the Central Asian nomadic societies were not insulated as lands that were impervious to historical change. The societies interacted had an impact on and learned from the larger world of which they were very much a part. The chapter studies the manner in which the Mongols under Genghis Khan adapted their traditional social and political customs to create a fearsome military machine and a sophisticated method of governance. The challenge of ruling a dominant spanning a melange of people, economics and confessional system meant that the Mongols could not simply impose their steppe tradition over their recently annexed territories. They innovated and compromised creating a nomadic empire that had a huge impact on the history of Eurasia even as it changed the character and composition of their own society forever. The steppe dwellers themselves usually produced no literature, so our knowledge of nomadic societies comes mainly from chronicles, travelogues, and documents produced by city-based literatures. These authors often produce extremely ignorant and biased reports of nomadic life. The imperial successes of the Mongols, however, attracted many literary. Some of them produce tribalogues of their experiences, others stayed to serve Mongol masters. These individuals came from a variety of backgrounds, Buddhist, Confucians, Christians, Turkish, and Muslim. Although not always familiar with the Mongol customs, many of them produced sympathetic accounts, even eulogies that challenged and complicated the otherwise hostile city-based tirade against the steppe marauders. The history of the Mongols therefore provide interesting detail to question the manner in which sedentary societies usually characterize nomads as primitive barbarians. 
The term barbarian is derived from the Greek barbaros, which meant a non-Greek, someone whose language sounded like a random noise, barbar. In Greek text, barbarians were depicted like children, unable to speak or reason properly, cowardly, effeminate, luxurious, cruel, slothful, greedy, and politically unable to govern themselves. The stereotype first to the Romans who used the term for the Germanic tribes, the Gauls and the Huns. The Chinese had different terms for the steppe barbarians, but none of them carried a positive meaning. Perhaps the most valuable research on the Mongols was done by Russian scholars starting in the 18th and 19th centuries as the Tsarist regime consolidated its control over Central Asia. This work was produced within a colonial Maloi and was largely survey notes produced by travelers, soldiers, merchants, and antiquarian scholars in the early 20th century after the extension of the Soviet republics in the regime, a new Marxist historiography argued that the prevalent mode of production determined the nature of social relations. It placed Genghis Khan and the emerging Mongol Empire within a scale of human evolution that was witnessing a transition from a tribal to a feudal mode of production from a relatively classless society to one where there were wide differences between the lord, the owners of land, and the peasant. Despite following such a deterministic interpretations of history, Excellent research on Mongol language, their society and culture was carried out by scholars such as Boris Yakolovich, Vladimir others such as Vasily Vladimir Bartold did not quite toe the official line. At a time when the Stalinist regime was extremely wary of regional nationalism, Bartold's Sympathetic and positive assessment of the career and achievement of the Mongols under Genghis Khan and his successor got him into trouble with the censor. It severely curtailed the circulation of the work of the scholar, and it was only in the 1960s, during and after the more liberal Khrushchev era, that his writings were published in nine volumes. The transcontinental span of the Mongol Empire also meant that the sources available to scholars are written in a vast number of languages. Far as the most crucial are the sources in Chinese, Mongolian, Persian, and Arabic. But vital materials are also available in Italian, Latin, French, and Russian. Often the same text was produced in two languages with differing contents. For example, the Mongolian and Chinese versions of the earliest narrative on Genghis Khan titled Mongol, Mongol Arn, New Atobia and the Sacred History of the Mongols are quite different and the Italian and Latin version of Marco Polo's travel to the Mongol court do not match. Since the Mongols produced little literature on their own and were instead written about by literary from foreign cultural milieus, historians have to often double as philologists to pick out the meanings of phrases for their closest approximation to Mongol uses. The work of scholars like Igor D. Ratchewilf on the sacred history of the Mongols and Gerhard Dorfer on Mongol and Turkic terminologies that infiltrate into the Persian language brings out the difficulties involved in studying the history of the Central Asian nomads. As we will notice through the remainder of this chapter, despite their incredible achievement, there is much about Genghis Khan and the Mongol world empire still awaiting the diligent scholar scrutiny. Introduction
in the early decades of the 13th century, the great empires of the Eurasian continent realized that dangers posed to them by the arrival of a new political power in the steppes of Central Asia, Genghis Khan. Uh, that uh, 1227 had united the Mongol people. Genghis Khan's political vision, however, went far beyond the creation of a confederacy of Mongol. Mapuan, the Mongol Empire. Mongol Empire, Mongolia, Karakoram, Durfan, China, Hangzhou. Moscow, Russian principalities, Europe, Byzantine Empire, Black Sea, Caspian Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Baghdad, Arabia, Red Sea, Persian Gulf, Persia, Ormuz, Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, India, Delhi, Himalayas, Bay of Bengal, Burma, Guangzhou, Tibet, Tuscant, Bukhara, Samarkand, Marv, Nishapur, Balkh, Herat, Tribes in the steppes of Central Asia he had a mandate from God to rule the world even through his own lifetime was spent consolidating his hold over the Mongol tribes, leading and directing campaigns into adjoining areas in North China, Transoxiana, Afghanistan, Eastern Iran and the Russian steppes. His descendants traveled further afield to fulfill Genghis Khan's vision and create the largest empire the world had ever seen. It was in the spirit of Genghis Khan's ideals that his grandson Monke, 1251-60, warned the French ruler Louis IX, 1226-70, in heaven there is only one eternal sky. On earth there is only one Lord Genghis Khan, the son of heaven. When, by the power of the eternal heaven, the whole world from the rising of the sun to its setting shall be at one in joy and peace, then it will be made clear what we are going to do. If, when you have understood the decree of the eternal heaven, you are unwilling to pay attention and believe it, saying, Our country is far away, our mountains are mighty, our seas is vast, and in this confidence you bring an army against us. We know what we can do. He who made easy what was difficult and near what was far off, the eternal heavens knows. These were not empty threats, and the 1236 to 41 campaigns of Batu, another grandson of Genghis Khan, devastated Russian lands up to Moscow, says Poland and Hungary, and camped outside Vienna. In the 13th century, it did seem that the eternal sky was on the side of Mongols and many parts of China. The Middle East and Europe saw in Genghis Khan's conquest of the inhabited world the worth of God, the beginning of the Day of Judgment. The Capture of Bukhara Juani, a late 13th century Persian chronicle, of the Mongol rulers of Iran carried an account of the capture of Bukhara in 1220. After the conquest of the city, Juwain reported Genghis Khan went to the festival ground where the rich residents of the city were and addressed them, O oh, people, know that you have committed great sins and that the great ones among you have committed their sins. If you ask me what proof I have for these words, I say it is because I am the punishment of God. If you had not committed great sins, God would not have sent a punishment like me upon you. Now one man had escaped from Bukhara after its capture and had come to Khurasan. He was questioned about the fate of the city and replied, they came. They mined the wealth, they burned, they slew, they plundered, and they departed. 
Activity 1. Assume that Joanne's account of the capture of Bukhara is accurate. Imagine yourself as a resident of Bukhara and Khurasans who hear the speeches. What impact would they have had on you? Comment this. How did the Mongols create an empire that dwarfed the achievements of the other world conqueror Alexander? In a pre-industrial age of poor technological communication, what skills were deployed by the Mongols to administer and control such a vast dominion? For someone so self-confidently aware of his moral, divinely dispensed right to rule, how did Genghis Khan relate to the diverse social and religious groups that comprise his dominion? In the making of his imperium, what happened to this plurality? We need to start our discussion, however, with a humbler set of questions to better comprehend the social and political background of the Mongols and Genghis Khan. Who were the Mongols? Where did they live? Who did they interact with? And how do we know about their society and politics? Social and political background. The Mongols were a diverse body of people linked by similarities of the language to the Tatars, Khaitan, and Manchuas to the east and the Turkic tribes to the west. Some of the Mongols were pastoralists while others were hunter gatherers. The pastoralists tended horses, sheep, and to a lesser extent cattle, goats, and camels. They nomadized. Uh, in the steppe of Central Asia in a tract of land in the area of the modern state of Mongolia. This was and still is a majestic landscape with wide horizon, rolling flames, ranged by the snow-capped Altai mountains to the west, the arid Gobi desert in the south and drained by the Onon and Selangor river and myriad spring from the melting snows of the hills in the north and west Loves luxuriant grasses for pasture and considerable small game were available in a good season. The hunter gatherers resided to the north of the Omon River, plains in flat. Pastoralists in the Siberian forest, they were a humbler body of people than the pastoralists making a living from trade in furs of animal trapped in the summer months. There were extremes of temperature in the entire region. Hearts, long winters followed by brief dry summers. Agriculture was possible in the pastoral regions during short parts of the year, but the Mongols, unlike some of the Turks farther west, did not take to farming. Neither the pastorals nor the hunting gathering economics could sustain dense population settlements, and as a result, the region possessed no cities. The Mongols lived in tents, girls, and traveled with their herds from their winter to summer pasture land. Listed below are some of the great Central Asian steppe confederacies of the Turks and Mongol people. They did not all occupy the same region and were not equally large and complex in their internal organizations. They had a considerable impact on the history of the nomadic population, but their impact on China and the adjoining regions varied. Zheng Nu, 200 BC Turks, Zhuan Zhuan, 400 C Mongols, Eptalite Hans, 400 C Mongols, Tu Chua, 550 C Turks, Uyghurs 740 C Turks, Khaitan 940 C Mongols. Ethnic and language tribes untitled united the Mongols people, but the scarce resources meant that their society was divided into patrilineal 
lineage. The richer family were larger, possessed more animals and pasture lands. They therefore had many followers and were more influenced in local politics, periodic and natural climates. Either unusually harsh cold winter when game and stored provision run out or drought which burst the grassland would force families to forage further a field leading to conflict over pasture, land and predatory raids in search of livestock. Group of families would occasionally ally for offensive and defensive purposes around richer and more powerful lineage but bearing the few exceptions these confederacies were usually small and short-lived. The size of Genghis Khan's confederation of Mongols and Turkish tribes was perhaps matched in size only by that which had been stitched together in the 5th century by Attila, day 453. Unlike Attila, however, Genghis Khan's political system was far more durable and survived its founder. It was stable enough to counter larger armies with superior equipment in China, Iran, and Eastern Europe. And as they established control over these regions, the Mongol administered complex agrarian economics and urban settlement, sedentary societies that were quite distant from their own social experience and habitat. Although the social and political organizations of the nomadic and agrarian economics were very different. The two societies were hardly foreign to each other. In fact, the scent resources of the steppe land drop Mongols and other Central Asian nomads to trade and barter with their sedentary neighbors in China. This was mutually beneficial to both parties. Agriculture produce and iron utensils from China were exchanged for horses, furs, and game trapped in the steppe. Commerce was not without its tensions, especially as the two groups unhesitatingly applied military pressure to enhance profit. When the Mongol lineage allied, they could force their Chinese neighbors to offer better terms, and trade ties were sometimes discarded in favor of outright plunder. The rela this relationship would Alter when the Mongols were in desire. The Chinese would they confidently assert their influence in the steppe. This frontier was were more debilitating to settled societies. They They dislocated agriculture and plundered cities. Nomads, on the other hand, could retreat away from the zone of conflict with marginal losses. Throughout its history, China suffered extensively from nomads' intrusion and different regimes. Even as early as the 8th century BC built fortification to protect their subjects, Starting from the 3rd century BC, this fortification started to be integrated into a common defensive outwork known today as the Great Wall of China. A dramatic visual testament to the disturbance and fear perpetrated by nomadic raids on the agrarian societies of North China. The Great Wall of China The Carrier of Genghis Khan Genghis Khan was born sometime around 1162 near the Onon rivers in the north of present-day Mongolia, named Temuzin. He was the son of Esugei, the chieftain of the Kiat, a group of the families related to the Borzigit clan. His father was murdered at an early age and his mother, Welan Eki, raised Temujin. His brothers and stepbrothers in great hardship, the following decades. 
was full of reversal. Temujin was captured and enslaved and soon after his marriage, his wife, Borte, was kidnapped and he had to fight to recover her. During these years of hardship, he also managed to make important friends. The young Bhagurchu was his first ally and remained a trusted friend. Jamuka, his blood brother, Anda, was another. Temujin also restored old alliances with the ruler of the Karits, Tugril or Ong Khan, his father's old blood brother. Through the 1180s and 1190s, Temujin remained an ally of Ong Khan and used the alliance to defeat powerful adversaries like Jamuka, his old friend who had become a hostile foe. It was after defeating him that Temujin felt confident enough to move against other tribes, the powerful Tatars, his father's assassins. The carriers and Ong Khan himself in 1203, the final defeat of the Naiman people and the powerful Jamuka in 1206, left Temujin as the dominant personality in the politics of the steppe lands, a position that was recognized at an assembly of Mongol chieftain Quarital, where he was proclaimed the great Khan of the Mongols, Quan, with the title Genghis Khan the oceanic Khan or universal ruler just before the quarrel of 1206. Genghis Khan had reorganized the Mongol people into a more effective disciplined military forces, say following section, that facilitated the success of his future campaign. The first of his concern was to conquer China, divided at this time into two realms. The Hashishya, people of Tibetan origin in the northwestern provinces, the Jurchen, whose Qin dynasty ruled North China from Peking, the Sung dynasty, who controlled South China by 1209, the Hashishya was defeated, the Great Wall of China was breached in 1213, and Peking sacked in 1215, long drawn out. Battles against the Qin continued until 1234, but Genghis Khan was satisfied enough with the progress of his campaign to return to his Mongolian homeland in 1216 and leave the military affairs of the region to his subordinates. After the defeat in 1218 of the Khita, who controlled the Tian Shan Mountains, northwest of China, Mongol dominions reached the Amu Darya and the states of Transoxiana and Khwarezm. Sultan Muhammad, the ruler of Khwarezm, felt the fury of Genghis Khan's rage when they executed Mongol envoys. In the campaigns between 1219 and 1221, the great cities, Otrar, Bukhara, Samarkand, Balak, Gurzang, Marf, Nishapur, and Herat surrendered to the Mongol forces. Towns that resisted were devastated. At Nishapur, where a Mongol prince was killed during the siege operation, Genghis Khan commanded that the town should be laid west in such a manner that the site could be ploughed upon, and that in the execution exaction of vengeance for the death of the prince, not even cats and dogs should be left alive. Estimated extent of Mongol destruction. All report of Genghis Khan's campaign agree at the vast number of people killed following the capture of cities that defied his authority. The numbers of Staggering at the capture of Nishapur in 1220, 17,47,000 people were massacred, while the toll at Herat in 1222 was 16 lakh people, and Baghdad in 1.25 crore 88 lakhs. 
smaller towns suffered proportionately Nasha 70,000 dead Vaihak district 70,000 and at Tun in the Khuistan provinces 12,000 individuals were executed how did medieval chronicles arrive at such figures Joanne the Persian chroniclers of the Ilkhan stated that 13 lakh people were killed in Marv. He raised the figure because it took 13 days to count the dead and each day they counted 1 lakh corpses. Opposite page, barbarians as imagined by the European artist. Mongol force in pursuit of Sultan Mehmed pushed into Azerbaijan, defeated Russian forces at the Crimea and encircled the Caspian Sea. Another wing followed the Sultan from Jalaluddin into Afghanistan and the Sindh provinces at the banks of the Indus. Genghis Khan considered returning to Mongolia through North India and Asham, but the heat the natural habitat and ill portent reported by the shaman Susayar made him change his mind. Genghis Khan died in 1227. Having spent most of his life in military combat, his military achievements were astounding and they were largely a result of his ability to innovate and transform different aspects of steppy combat into extremely effective military strategies. The horse riding skills of the Mongols and the Turks provided speed and mobility to the army. Their abilities as rapid shooting archers from horseback were further perfected during regular hunting expedition which doubled as field maneuvers. The steppy cavalry had always traveled light and moved quickly. But now it brought all this knowledge of the terrain and the weather to do the unimaginable. They carried out campaigns in the depth of winter, treating frozen rivers as highways to enemy cities and camps. Nomads were conventionally at a loss against fortified encampments, but Genghis Khan learned the importance of such engines and naphtha bombardment very quickly. His engineers prepared light portable equipment which was used against opponents with devastating effect. See 1167 birth of Temujin, 1160s to 17th year spent in slavery and struggle, 1080s to 90s period of alliance formation, 1203 to 27 expansion and triumph, 1206 Temujin proclaimed Genghis Khan universal ruler of the Mongols. 1227 Death of Genghis Khan. 1227 to Sectis rule of the three great Khans and continued Mongol unity. 1227 to 41 Ogodei son of Genghis Khan. 1246 to 49 Gowak son of Ogodei. 1251 to 60 Monke, son of Genghis Khan's youngest son, Tolui, 1236 to 42, campaigns in Russia, Hungary, Poland, and Austria under Batu, son of Jochi, Genghis Khan's eldest son, 1253 to 55, beginning of press campaigns in Iran and China under Monke, 1258, capture of Baghdad and the end of the Abbasid Caliphate, established of the Second Khanid states, Iran under Hulegu, we younger brother of Monke, beginning of conflict between the Jochit and the Second Khans. One thousand two hundred sixty accessions of Kublai Khan, accessions of Kublai Khan as Grand Khan in Peking. Conflict amongst descendants of Genghis Khan's fragmentation of Mongol realm into independent Lenus, Dolui, 
Changetai and Jochi Ogodes lineage defeated and absorbed into the Dalit. Dalit's Yuan dynasty in China and two Khan state in Iran. Changetai's in steppes north the Transoxiana and Turkistan's Jochi lineage in the Russian steppes described as the Golden Hordy by observers. 1257-67 Reign of Barke, son of Batu Reorientation of the Golden Hardy from Nestorian Christianity toward Islam Definition conversion takes place only in the 1350s Start of the alliance between the Golden Hardy and Egypt against the Second Khans 1295-1304 to Reign of Second Khanite ruler Gajan Khan in Iran, his conversion from Buddhism to Islam is followed gradually by other second Khanate chieftains. 1368 end of one dynasty in China. 1370 to 1405 rule of Timur, a barless Turk who claimed Genghis Khanate descent through the lineage of Changatai. Establishes a steppe empire that assimilates parts of dominance of Tolui, excluding China. Changatai and Jochi pro proclaim himself Gurejian, royal son in law, and marries a princess of the Genghis Khanate lineage. 1495 to 1530, Jahiruddin Babur, descendant of Temur and Genghis Khan, succeeded to Temurai territory of. Fargana and Samarkand in expelled captures Kabul and in 1526 saves Delhi and Agra, founds the Mughal Empire in India. 1500 Capture of Transoxiana by Shaibani Khan, descendant of Jochi's youngest son, Shiban, consolidates Shaibani power. Shaibaniers also described as Uzbeks from whom Uzbekistan today gets its name in Transoxiana and expelled Babur and other Timurais from the region. 1759 Manchus of China conquer Mongolia. 1921 Republic of Mongolia. The Mongols after Genghis Khan. We can divide Mongols' expansions after Genghis Khan's death into two distinct phases. The first, which spanned the years 1236 to 42, when the major gains were in Russian steppes, Bulgar, Kiev, Poland, and Hungary. The second phase, including the war year 1255 to 1300, led to the conquest of all the chi all of China. 1279. Iran, Iraq, and Syria. The frontier of the empire stabilized after this campaign. The Mongol military forces met with few reversals in the decades after 1203, but quite noticeably after the 1260s original impetus. Of campaigns could not be sustained in the West, although Vienna and beyond it, West turned Europe, as well as Egypt, was within the grasp of Mongol forces their retreat from the Hungarian steppes and defeat at the hands of the Egyptian forces signaled the emergence of new political trends. There were two phases to this. The first was the consequences of the internal politics of succession within the Mongol family where the descendants of Jochi and Ogodei allied to control the office of the Great Khan in the first two generations. This interest were more important than the pursuit of campaigns in Europe. The second comparisons occurred as the Jochi and Ogodei lineage were marginalized by the Toluid branch of Genghis Khanate descent with the accession of Monke, a descendant of Toli, Genghis Khan's youngest son, military campaigns were pursued energetically in Iran during the 1250s, but Toluid interest in the conquest of China increased during 
the 1200 sector sports and supplies were increasingly diverted into the heartland of, of the mongol dominion as a result the mongols fielded a small understaffed force against the egyptian military their defeat and the increasing preoccupations with china of the tolit family marked the end of western expansion of the mongols Concurrently, conflict between the Jochit and Tolid descendants along the Russian-Iranian frontier diverted and Jochit away from further European campaign. The suspension of Mongol expansion in the West did not arrest their campaigns in China, which was reunited under the Mongols. Paradoxically, it was at the moment of its greatest successions that internal turbulence between members of the ruling family manifested itself the next section discussed the factors that led to some of the greatest successes of the mongol political enterprise but also inhibited its progresses social political and military organizations among the mongols and many other nomadic societies as well all the able bodied adult males of the tribe bore arms they constituted the armed forces when the occasion demanded the unification of the different mongol tribe and subsequent campaigns against the diverse people introduced new members into genghis khan's army complex getting the composition of the relatively small undifferentiated body into an incredibly heterogeneous masses of people it includes groups like the turkic Uyghurs who had accepted his authority willingly it also included defeated people like the carriers who were accommodated in the confederacy despite their early earlier hostility Genghis Khan worked to systematically rush the old tribal identities of the different groups who joined his confederacy his army was organized according to the old steppe systems of decimal units in division of tens hundreds one thousands and notionally ten thousand soldiers in the old system the clan and the tribe would have coexisted within the decimal units genghis khan stopped this practice he divided the old tribal groupings and distributed their members into new military units any individual who tried to move from his or her allotted group without permission received harsh punishment the largest unit of soldier approximating 10000 soldiers to man now included fragmented groups of people from a variety of different tribes and clans the altered the old steppe social order integrating different lineage and clans and providing them with a new identity derived from its progenitor Genghis Khan the new the new military contingents were required to serve under his portions and specially chosen captains of his army units called Noyan also important within the new realm were a band of followers who had served Genghis Khan loyally through grave adversity for many years. Genghis Khan publicly honored some of these individuals as his blood brothers and dumb. Yet others, freemen of a humbler rank, were given special ranking as his bondsmen, Naukar, a title that marked their close relationship with their master. This is a title that marked their close relationship with their master. This ranking did not preserve the rights of the old clan chieftains. The new aristocracy derived its status from a close relationship with the great Khan of the Mongols. In this new hierarchy, Genghis Khan assigned the responsibility of governing the newly conquered people to his four sons. This comprised the four Ulus, a term 
that did not originally mean fixed territories. Genghis Khan's lifetime was still the age of rapid conquest and expanding domains where frontier were still extremely fluid. For example, the eldest son, Jochi, received the Russian steppes but the farthest extent of his territory. Ulus was inter indeterminate in extent as far west as his horses could roam. The second son, Jagatai was given the Transoxination steppe and land north of the Pamir Mountains adjacent to those of his brother. Presumably, these lands would shift as Jochi marched westward. Genghis Khan had indicated that his third son, Ogodei, would succeed at him as the Great Khan and on accessions the prince established his capital and Karakoram. The youngest son, Doloi, received the ancestral lands of Mongolia. Genghis Khan envisaged that his sons would rule the empire collectively. And to underline this point, military contingents Tama of the individual princes were placed in each Ulus. The sense of a dominion shared by the members of the family was underlined at the assembly of chieftains, quadrilates, where all decisions relating to the family or the state for the forthcoming session, campaign, distribution of plunder, pasture lands, and succession were collectively taken. Family Tree of Genghis Khan Genghis Ogurev, Chengtai, Jochi, Tolui, Guyuk, Varki, Batu, Arikboki, Hulagu, Kublai, Monkey. The Mongol Dynasty Husband to several wives, Genghis Khan fathered many children. The four sons by his principal wife, Bodhi, formed the limbs of his dynastic tree. The house of eldest son, Jochi, never produced a great Khan, but it wielded great power by his refusal to support Ongdri line after the death of Kurak, Jochi's son, Batu, forced a power shift to the Tolui house, this opening the way for Monkey and Kublai. No image exists for Tolui, Barke and Ari, Boke, except for the hatred great counts. All are shown with traditional shaped hands. Genghis Khan had already fashioned a rapid courier system that connected the distant areas of his regime. Fresh mounts and dispatch riders were placed in outposts at regularly spaced distances for the maintenance of this communication system. The Mongol nomads contributed a tenth of their herd, either horses or livestock, as provisions. This was called the Quapkur tax, a levy that the nomads paid willingly for the multiple benefit that it brought the courier system, Yam was further refined after Genghis Khan's death and its speed and reliability sur surprised traveler. It enabled the great Khans to keep a check on developments at farthest end of their regime across the continental landmass. The conquered people, however, hardly felt a sense of affinity with their new nomadic master during the campaigns in, in the first half of the 13th century cities were destroyed. Agricultural lands, light, waste, trade, and handicraft production disrupted tens of thousands of people. The exact figure are whole lost in the Exaggerated reports of the time were killed. Even more, and slept all classes of people from the 
leads to the present suffered in the resulting instability the underground canals called quarters in the arid Iranian plateau could no longer receive periodic maintenance as they fell into disrepair the desert crept in this led to an ecological devastation from which parts of Khurasan never recovered. Once the dust from the campaign had settled, Europe and China were territorial, territorially linked in the peace assured in by Mongol conquest. Pax Mongolica trade connection matured, commerce and travel along the Silk Route reached its peak under the Mongols, but unlike before, the trade routes did not terminate in China. They continued north into Mongolia and to Karakoram, the heart of the new empire, communication and ease of travel was vital to retain the coherence of the Mongol regime, and travelers were given. The Mongol campaigns Karakoram to Moscow, Europe, Kanati of the Golden Hordi, Hangzhou, Empire of the Great Khan, Turfan, Tibet, Changtai Empire, Tuscant, Bukhara, Samarkand, Balkh, Nishapur, Her, Second Khan Empire, Baghdad, Caspian Sea, Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Damascus, Persian Gulf, Arabia, Red Sea, Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, India, Sultan of Delhi, Himalayas, Burma, Bay of Bengal, Zhuangzhou. Mongol campaigns under Zengis Khan. Mongol campaign post 1259, direction of Silk Route, activity 2, note the areas traversed by the Silk Route and the goods that were available to traders along the way, this map does not reflect one of the eastern terminal point of the Silk Route during the height of Mongol power. Can you place the missing city? Could it have been on the Silk Route in the 12th century? Why not? Comment this. A pass, Paisa in Persian, Gerki in Mongolian, for safe conduct, traders paid the bus tax for the same purpose, all acknowledging thereby the authority of the Mongol Khan. The contradiction between the nomadic and sedimentary elements within the Mongols' empire, yes, through the 13th century in the 1230s. For example, as the Mongols waged their successful war against the Qin dynasty in North China, there was a strong pressure group within the Mongol leadership that advocated the massacre of all peasantry and the conversion of their fields into pasture land by but by the 1270s when South China was annexed to the Mongol Empire after the defeat of the Song dynasty. Genghis Khan's grandson Kublai Khan, day 1294, appeared as the protector of the peasant and the cities in the 1290s, the Mongol ruler of Iran, Ghazan Khan, D. 1304, a descendant of Genghis Khan as the youngest son, Tolu, warned family members and other generals to avoid piloting the peasantry. It did not lead to a stable, prosperous realm. He advised in a speech whose sedentary overtones would have made Genghis Khan shudder. Activity 3. Why was there a conflict of interest between pastoralists and peasants? Would Genghis Khan have expressed sentiments of this nature in a speech to the nomad commander? Comment this. Ghazan Khan's speech. 
Ghazan Khan 1295 to 1304 was the first second Khanite ruler to convert to Islam. He gave the following speech to the Mongol Turkish nomad commander a speech that was probably drafted by his Persian wazir Rasiduddin and included in the minister's letter. I am not on the side of the Persian peasantry. If there is a purpose in piloting them all, there is no one with more power to do this than I. Let us rob them together. But if you wish to be certain of collecting grains and foods for your tables in the future, I must be harsh with you. You must be taught for reason. If you insult the peasantry, take their oxen and seed and tam trample their corpses into the ground, what will you do in the future? The obedient peasantry must be distinguished from the peasantry who are rebels. From Genghis Khan's reign itself, the Mongols had recruited civil administrators from the conquered societies. They were sometimes moved around Chinese secretaries deployed in Iran and Persian in China. They helped in integrating the distant dominions and their backgrounds and training were always useful in blunting the harsher edge of nomadic predation on sedimentary life. The Mongol Khan trusted them as long as they continued to raise revenue for their master and this administrator could sometimes command considerable influences. In the 1230s, the Chinese minister Hielu Chutusai muted some of the Ogodes more rapacious instincts. The Juani family played some similar role in Iran through the latter half of the 13th century and at the end of the century. The wazir Rashiduddin drafted the speech that Gajan Khan delivered to his Mongol compatriots as king, them to protect, not harass the present the pressure of certain tribes was greater in the newer areas of Mongol domical areas distant from the original steppe habitant of the nomads. But the middle of the 13th century, the sense of a common patrimony shared by all the brothers was gradually replaced by individual dynasties, each ruling their separate ulus, a term which now carried the sense of a territorial dominion. This was in past a result of succession struggles where Genghis Khanate descendants competed for the office of the Great Khan and prized pastoral lands. Descendants of Toli had come to rule both China and Iran, where they had formed the one and second Khanate dynasties. Descendants of Jochi formed the Golden Horde and ruled the Russian steppes. Changchatai's successors ruled the steppes of Transoxianus and the Lands called Turkistan today, noticeably nomadic tradition, persisted longest among the steppe dwellers in Central Asia, descendants of Changtetai, and Russia, the Golden Horde. The gradual separation of the descendants of Genghis Khan into separate lineage groups implied that their connection with the memory. And tradition of a past family concordance also altered at an obvious level. This was the result of competition among the cows and clans on hair. The toilet branch was more adept in presenting their version of the family disagreements in the historic produce under their patronage. To a large extent, this was a consequence of their control of China and Iran and the large number of literati that its family members could recruit. At a more sophisticated level, the disengagement with the past also meant underlining the merits of the regnant rulers as a contrast to other past monarchs. This exercise in comparison did not exclude Genghis Khan himself. Persian chronicles produced in Second Khanate Iran during the late 13th century detailed the gory killings 
of the Great Khan and greatly exaggerated the numbers killed. For example, in contrast to an eyewitness report that 400 soldiers defended the citadel of Bukhara and Second Khanavid Chronicles reported that 30,000 soldiers were killed in the attack on the citadel. Although Second Khanavid reports still eulogies Genghis Khan, they also carried a statement of relief. The times had changed and the great killings of the past were over. The Genghis Khanavid legacy was important but for his descendants to appear as convincing heroes to a sedentary audience, they could no longer appear in quite the same way as their ancestors. Following the research of David Ayalon recent work on the Yesha, the Code of Laws that Genghis Khan was supposed to have promulgated at the Qu Quadiltai of 1206, has elaborated on the complex ways in which the memory of the Great Khan was fashioned by his successor in its earliest formulation. The term was written as Yasak, which meant law, decree, or order. Indeed, the few details that we possess about the Yasak concern administrative regulation, the organizations of the hunt, the army, and the postal system by the middle of the 13th century. However, the Mongols have started using the related term Yasha in a more general sense to mean the legal code of Genghis Khan. We may be able to understand the changes in the meaning of the term if we take a look at some of the other developments that occurred at the same time by the middle of the 13th century. The Mongols had emerged as a unified people and just created the largest empire the world had ever seen. They ruled over very sophisticated urban societies with their respective histories, cultures, and laws. As although the Mongols dominated the region, politically they were a numerical minority, the one way in which they could protect their identity and distinctives was through a claim to a sacred law given to them by their ancestors, the Yesha was in all probability a compilation of the customary tradition of the Mongol tribes, but in referring to it as Genghis Khan's code of law, the Mongol people also laid claim to a lawgiver like Moses and Solomon, whose authoritative code could be imposed on their subjective the Yasa served to go ahead in the Mongol people around a body of shared beliefs. It acknowledged their affinity to Genghis Khan and his descendants and even as they absorbed different aspects of a sedentary lifestyle, gave them the confidence to retain their ethnic identity and impose their law upon the defeated subject. It was an extremely empowering ideology and all the Genghis Khan may not have planned such a legal code. It was certainly inspired by his passion and was vital in the construction of a Mongol universal dominion. Activity 4. Did the meaning of Yesha alter over the four centuries separating Genghis Khan from Abdullah Khan? Why did Hafiz -e Tanish make a reference to Genghis Khan's Yesha in connection with Abdullah Khan's prayer at the Muslim festival ground? Comment this. Yesha. In 1221, after the conquest of Bukhara, Genghis Khan had assembled in the rich Muslim resident at the festival ground and had admonized them. He called them sinners and warned them to compensate for their sins by parting with their hidden wealth. The episode was dramatic enough to be painted and for a long time after what people still remembered the incident in the late section century, Abdullah Khan, a distant descendant of Jochi, Genghis Khan's eldest son, went to the some festival ground in Bukhara. Unlike Genghis Khan, however, Abdullah Khan went to perform his holiday prayers there. His chronicler Hafiji Tadis reported this performance of Muslim piety by his master and included the surprising comment. This was according to the Yesha of Genghis Khan. 
conclusions situating Genghis Khan and the Mongols in world history. When we remember Genghis Khan today, the only images that appear in our imagination are those of the conqueror, the destroyer of cities, and an individual who was responsible for the death of thousands of people, many 13th century residents of towns in China, Iran, and Eastern Europe looked at the hordes from the steppes with fear and distrust, and yet, for the Mongols, Genghis Khan was the greatest leader of all time. He united the Mongol people freed from the interminable tribal wars and Chinese exploitations, brought them prosperity, passion, a grand transcontinental empire, and restored trade routes and markets that attracted distant travelers like the Venetia and Marco Polo. The contrasting images are not simply a case of dissimilar perspectives. They should make us pause and reflect on how one dominant perspective can completely erase all others. Behind the opinions of the different sedentary people, consider for a moment the sheer size of the Mongol dominion in the 13th century and the diverse body of people and faith that it is embarrassed. Although the Mongol Khan themselves belong to a variety of different faith, shaman, buddhist, christian, and individual islam. They never let their personal beliefs dictate public policy. The Mongol rulers recruited administrators and armed contingents from people of all ethnic groups and religions. Theirs was a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious regime that did not feel threatened by its pluralistic constitution. This was utterly unusual for the time and historians and only now studying the ways in which the Mongols provided ideological models for later regimes like the Mughals of India to follow. The nature of the documentation of the Mongols and any nomadic regimes make it virtually impossible to understand the inspiration that led to the confederation of fragmented groups of people in the pursuit of an ambition to create an empire, the Mongol Empire eventually altered in its different millers, but the inspiration of its founder remained a powerful force. At the end of the 14th century, Timur, another monarch who aspired to universal dominion, hesitated to declare himself monarch because he was not of Genghis Khan's descent. When he had declared his independent sovereignty, it was as the son-in-law, Guregao, of the Genghis Khanid family. Two days after decades of Soviet control, the country of Mongolia is recreating its identity as an independent nation. It was faced upon Genghis Khan as a great national hero who is publicly venerated and whose achievements are recounted with pride. At a crucial juncture in the history of Mongolia, Genghis Khan had has Genghis Khan has once again appeared as an iconic figure for the Mongol people, mobilizing memories of the great past in the forging of national identity that can carry the nation into the future. The capture of Baghdad by the Mongols, a miniature painting in the chronicles of Rashid al-Din, the bridge, 14th century. Kublai Khan and Chabi in camps. Exercise and Sorin Brip and Sorin a short essay. Comment this.